Well, hello, strangers. Welcome or welcome back to another true scary story. This one is story number 79. We've all seen it. Whenever some criminal gets outed out of nowhere, there's always some rube in the community who gets splashed across the five o'clock news. Blinking and bewildered, they're full of, oh gosh, oh golly. But the criminal just seemed so nice, so normal. Why, I couldn't imagine him being the Brooklyn bludgeoner. Etc., etc. And maybe sometimes that's true. That some predator was so conniving, peering out from under their sheepskin only in deepest night and strictest privacy. But I don't believe that any of these outings could ever be a complete surprise. The thing we've all learned from the recent pandemic, I should hope, is how unnatural and uncomfortable it is to wear a mask, after all. It's in our culture to be 100% authentic, never gilding the lily because it feels like a lie. And even a practiced predator who has the self-awareness to know that there's some unacceptable bits of them they'd better keep locked up if they don't want to be shunned. Well, they're only human. Barely. But they're going to make mistakes. They're going to slip up. Especially early on, in their childhood, before they get good at it. And that's why whenever I see a childhood friend or relative attest that they didn't know, they didn't see it coming, I don't believe them. Maybe they didn't know no, but did they not sense that something was sour or offbeat? Or did they just not want to? Maybe they just felt dumb. Maybe they squashed it down, ignored it, didn't want to rock the boat. And now that the crimes were splashed in the headlines, like blood at a crime scene, they felt dumb for being had. Maybe their claims to have never seen it coming are more protection of their own ego than the outed friend in question. But they knew, because when I opened Facebook and saw the headlines racing across my feed like wildfire, my only thought was, so that's what he was finally caught doing. Over the next few days, private messages popped up in my inbox as I'm sure they did in others. Mutual friends, friends who weren't mutuals but were otherwise aware. All of us coming together like a support group. Or, I'm sure that's how it was supposed to feel. About the fourth message I got expressing, Gosh, did you see? Did you hear? Is it true? I just stopped responding. Stopped even logging in. If I'm going to tell it, I'll tell it here to you, and you do what you want with it. I met Leo when I was 15. He was part of my main group of friends from school. It was a private school, smaller classes, more co-mingling on the sports teams to have enough players. When I'd go down to a party, it wasn't unusual that one of us freshmen would have invited a few juniors or seniors from lacrosse or soccer. Leo was a senior who began turning up at all the parties I did, and that was perfectly fine. Leo was funny, nice, not brilliant, but it's not like you need to be a poet laureate to nick the occasional half bottle of scotch that invariably made its way to our little shindigs. Though, to be honest, Leo's dad was some higher up in the school administration it was just as likely that he was one of those my eldest son can do no wrong types that would have permitted a little underage drinking. Hell, maybe encouraged it. Or, at the very least, pretended not to notice. Few of those around. It would explain Leo's hale and hearty, down for anything and damn the consequences behavior. Anyways... One such Saturday night, we were at a party like any other. Kid whose house it was, 
let's say his name was Josh, had a kid sister named Madison. She used to really holler about wanting to hang out when Josh had friends over. Of course, we did not want a bratty little interloper bugging us and having to sneak any drinking around her. She'd made a stink about it that night, with Josh telling her once again she wasn't welcome. With the disdain every 12-year-old girl reserves for their least favorite cartoon character, she said she couldn't be paid to hang around us, and that we all smelled of old socks and farts. Which was probably truer than we would have liked to admit. But assured of her cooperation, we descended into the unfinished basement that had been designated as a rec room. We got out the old PlayStation, and we got to business. It got late, though, and wound down. As kids got rides or rode bikes off into the dark, it came to seven of us who decided to crash at the house. We'd sleep it off and mask any lingering trace of that night's sinful communion with mouthwash. Leo was among the seven staying on, and so we all chose our spots on random sofas, recliners, and sleeping bags. We got settled. There was a half bath in the basement, and somehow I'd been the first to use it. As the other guys filed in to take their turns, I curled up on the little two-seater love seat and fell asleep. I planned to sleep off the worst of the sickly sweet hangover I felt coming my way. Which is why, when I slowly awoke only a bit later, I was puzzled. It was one of those wakings when your eyes just seemed to slide open of their own accord. The shop was open for business, and I was perfectly, completely awake, with no reason why. I laid there, motionless in the dark, and assessed the situation. My bladder hadn't woken me, nor a need to offload the liquor via a cleansing purge. Had there been a noise? I listened. It was still, silent at first. A couple of grunts and mutters, the other six guys just moving in their sleep. From what it sounded like, I was the only one awake. But then, just as I decided it was one of those random things, my sleep cycle of light to deep to REM sleep finishing, and I'd woken instead of following it with another loop. I heard it. There was a rustling sound. Not random. Rhythmic. But not rustling. Not exactly. It wasn't like cloth. It was like scratching. The sound, the back and forth motion of it was familiar. But I couldn't place it until... Oh, it hit me like a rock. I knew what it was. Every boy between the ages of 15 to, well, probably death, would clock it. All at once, I felt embarrassed, disgusted, and trapped. Embarrassed on behalf of whichever of my friends didn't know not to give in to whatever dream or urge was making them do that disgusted because, God, I didn't agree to be an audience to this, and trapped because if I moved or said something, well, but otherwise I was just stuck here, just bearing witness. I was a virgin, and I'd bet most of my friends were too, but we all knew this was dirty. There was a reason we referred to that area on the body as privates, after all. My eyes were still closed, but slitted open. With knots in my stomach, I didn't want to see it, but like a car crash ahead, I couldn't help but look. I scanned the room. I figured I'd see some slight motion from someone laying on the floor. I nearly jumped when, instead... I saw a shape, a guy, 
who up until about five seconds before was just a friend, a teammate, was standing in the middle of the room, near center, amidst all my sleeping friends. It was dark, but I had good night vision, and I could see. It was Leo. Leo, the senior. Mr. Popular Kid. Leo, with his rich home and important parents, was standing there above the kids on the floor, with the front of his pants pulled down and his hand moving back and forth. Even though I was terrified to look to his face, chance making eye contact, I had to. He was scanning the room, just looking at all of our sleeping, trusting friends, which was so confusing. Again, I'd assumed he'd had some urge or dream that had excited him into action, but as his gaze swept the room, it was like this was the urge. Something about all of us slumbering unaware at his feet, and here he was, getting away with a bad thing. And here I was, trapped in place, letting it happen. All I could think was, God, what a gross dude. I decided to pretend to wake up, ruin his fun. No way I'd be able to just lay here and listen to him finish. So I started making some low, confused, waking up sounds. I started like moving and stretching a bit, acting like I was just coming up and out of sleep as naturally as I could. The noise stopped. I heard a high-pitched gasp. I sensed quick movement from the area where he stood. By the time my little pantomime was over and I could sit up, acting sleepy, the standing figure was gone. I couldn't see which of the sleeping forms was Leo, but the sound had stopped. Thank God. For good measure, I got up and used the restroom. I took my time. I came back to the love seat and kept fidgeting, rolling, adjusting. I wanted to give him time to realize he wasn't going to finish his nasty little act that night. I must have been up for an hour until I finally got so sleepy, I just slipped back into unconsciousness, weary from all the fright and surprised and panicked disgust. I didn't tell anyone about it the next morning. He was a senior, and I was just a freshie whose only clout was being big and good enough to do varsity lacrosse. It could easily backfire. If I made an accusation and he denied it, there'd be no proof to make it one way or the other. But soon, very likely the story would become, oh hey, Roberts over here is having fantasies about his team. Then it would be me people were whispering about. So I said nothing. But that incident stuck in my head, and my attendance at parties usually didn't include staying the night anymore after that, not until Leo graduated and went off to do his obligatory legacy tour at one of the Ivy League schools. I was happy to forget about him. I didn't look for him for the next few years, the way that I'd reach out or ask about other guys I knew who graduated and moved on. I was more than happy to let him fade, even if that memory wouldn't. Cut to my senior year. The morning I got up, unlocked my phone, and saw a Facebook notification. I thumbed it open, and bam, a picture of Leo filled the screen. Leo looked cool and confident, despite it obviously being a booking photo. A mugshot? What? I remember thinking before taking in the headline next to it. A headline that echoed across my feed that morning and for days after. Local man charged with child trafficking, assault, production of obscene video, and photography. The child bit through me, but then again, what had happened years ago had been in a room full of freshies and sophomores 
14 to 16. My coffee sat bitter in my stomach that day as I again bore witness to the disgusting acts of a kid I'd literally grown up with. From what I could gather on the articles, the charges gave a timeline starting, and here my stomach did a lurch, starting my freshman year, the year of the sleepover. The victims were identified by letters, A through E. While details were scarce, a pattern of him preying on them was obvious. Then, of course, came the protestations, the he could never defenses from the community. God, what a load of bull. But the real horror, the part that has me up nights over it, ironically, came a day later. Like I said, I'd been non-committal in my responses to people reaching out, wanting to share their shock and disbelief with me. There was just something in the way they were talking to me that made me not want to talk to them. They were getting it all wrong. They were saying things like, This must be so hard for someone who knew him well. I can't imagine how it feels as one of his best friends. I'd been quick to correct them that no, we were not best friends, we were not even good friends. That tone bothered me, but what bothered me more was the number of people that, despite the damning evidence, seemed hell-bent on defending Leo. To them, I didn't know what to say. I just gave the typed equivalent of shrugging to try and stifle the conversation. Oh really? Well anyway, gotta go. A few of those, and they either got the idea, or realized I wasn't one to sympathize with their opinion. But when Josh, the kid at whose home said nightmare sleepover had taken place, reached out, it was without any fake preamble. He wrote me, Hey, pretty messed up. That was it. His entire opener. The tone was firm. There was no hint of hand-wringing over how it must be a mistake, not our Leo. I took a chance and wrote back, what an effing sicko. Immediately, my phone rang. It was Josh. He wanted to meet up. Half an hour later, I was in that rec room on the love seat. Life is chaotic and weird, but on occasion, it does indeed come full circle. Josh had been testing the waters to see which of his friends he could trust, and his careful probing had resulted in me and another guy who'd been on soccer with Josh and Leo, a kid I'll call David. You want a real horror story? Think back over the number of kids Josh and I ran around with, had over, celebrated birthdays with, and realized that only two of the ones he called didn't immediately jump to sniffing around for gossip or outright defending Leo. I get not wanting to rock the boat, but if the boat is full of human garbage, maybe it needs to be overturned, you know? As we sat, Josh paced before finally dropping the bomb. Victim A, as noted in the newspaper, was none other than Josh's kid sister, Madison. My stomach dropped as he spoke, even as my mind began fitting the pieces together. That night, we'd had our little sleepover. Madison had crept down to the rec room to spy on us. Harmless, bratty little sibling shit. But it had gotten late, and she'd fallen asleep in a closet under the stairs. She must have tried to leave after she thought we too had fallen asleep but she thought wrong. Leo was still awake, and seeing an opportunity, he took it. When I had pretended to wake up, he'd stopped. I knew that much, but what I didn't know was that when I was in the bathroom, he'd used his chance to close the distance between himself and the little closet where Madison was hiding. Through the cracked door, he told her she was a dirty little girl that it was obvious she'd snuck down to see the boys changing, that she would be in huge trouble if Leo told. 
But he told her he wouldn't tell, provided she did something for him. And for the rest of the summer, he'd use that threat to blackmail pictures out of her. When that wasn't enough, he used the pictures to pressure her into physical stuff. He told her that she had sent the pics, and that was obvious proof that she consented to anything Leo wanted. And Madison, she was 12. It didn't even occur to her that a 12-year-old couldn't have proof of consenting when she was under the legal age of doing so. She was just scared of being in trouble, of being thought of as dirty and nasty by her family, by her friends. She was desperate. She did what Leo asked. Leo did this to four other girls. Not all of them were minors. One was his own cousin. Josh, David, and I didn't discuss the others that night, though. Josh's face was red, crumpled in rage. As I sat there, it was hard not to feel like my desire to avoid awkwardness. Rocking the boat, the chance that my friends would flip it on me and tease me for imagining one of them in such an intimate act. Well, it's hard not to feel responsible for this sick, twisted jerk's reign of terror, which is why I knew what I had to do. And I did. Leo is currently on house arrest in his family's mansion. He's awaiting his day in court. While he's been out, multiple stories, counter accusations, and even emails with such zingers as, remember, he hasn't been convicted of anything, have flowed from Leo's friends, family, and his team of high-priced lawyers. Meanwhile, his victims have to remain silent to protect the DA's case. Once I contacted their office, told them what I could testify to, I was under the same caution not to tell anyone before the day I gave my account. Leo's apparently under no such lawyer leash, and he's trying to win points in the court of public opinion. Just a bunch of he said, she said, reported one mutual. That's his latest story. Well, boy, is he going to be surprised at the he said, he said coming his way. The names are changed, and I've very purposely not given the location. It's a big family, small town thing anyway. But I'm chancing, blowing the whole thing, to tell you if you were ever in the position that I was. For the love of God, be better than me. Say something. If you don't, you have no idea how many others might pay for your silence. It is unfortunate that while this is a story one of my friends shared with me, that I have a similar one myself, as does another friend who's provided one. We might get around to telling those at some point too. Stay safe out there, my strangers. Stay strange, but stay safe. And until next time, take care, my strangers. 